Well, just, just a couple of things before we jump into the lesson. For those who are, are watching the videos or watching online, uh, for the email list, I've sent out that anybody that's even watching online, I, I, we have several people that we know that watch the live stream and participate that way and would participate in person if they could. If, if you can come to the uh, May 7th combined gathering, email me, text me, call me, let me know so we can kind of get a count of that. But for all of the rest of you, uh, yeah, send that um, that clipboard back down. I, Sandy, Sandy didn't get to sign it, I don't think, did you? Yeah, did, you did it come through? Okay, couldn't remember if you'd come in when that came up or not. But, but anyway, uh, second thing I want to ask, though, is if you're using those lesson sheets, that, that I wrote to go with each other. You know, there's six single sheet things and then I had an overall set of questions. Um, you know, if they're used or not used, you know, I just, if people are not using, I know that, that uh, on my blog that it gets clicked on several times. So apparently somebody's downloading them and using them, but, but I just need to know whether or not to do that, if that's helpful or not to kind of, uh, as I told uh, Kim, who was new last week, I said, they're primarily just to sort of guide you in your study, just just to give you maybe something to look at that you hadn't thought about looking at. So, so you can let me know about that later. But so now, chapter seven. As you read chapter seven, maybe uh, read over the last part of chapter six because you know how that flows together. First of all, we just want to discuss what what did you observe. What were your thoughts or questions? What did you already know? What surprised you about this chapter? Or just anything that you want to share about chapter 7 and the last half of chapter 6 and chapter 7. Well, I'm glad you put down the uh, the Leviticus and Deuteronomy uh, verses to go look at because I got really confused between clean and unclean animals. Yeah, yeah. And now I didn't realize a pig was unclean. Oh yeah. Oh, you know they can't eat bacon or pork or the Jews. Yeah, no, that's a big well, that's deal. Right, that's right. That's right. That's what. Who was? I can't remember who it was. Some some messianic Jew I was hearing speak, and he said, "And now I can have bacon." <laughs> so, <laughs> that was a big deal. Wish I could have bacon. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that. But, and you know what's interesting about that is. We'll talk more about it when we get to that point. But we have the detail of it in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. But, I mean, we're talking about, let's see, what, a thousand years before that. How did they even know what was clean and unclean? That's that's what I wanted to know. But, but yeah, that does at least give you what Moses was thinking about when he wrote that down. So, what else? Why seven? Why seven? seven. Yeah. Why seven clean animals and why seven of the birds? Yeah. I didn't get why the why the birds. The birds yeah. Why the birds? Yeah. Yeah. We, we'll we'll get we'll get to that. That's that's a great question. The, they can fly back to the ark. Yeah, but after so long a time, yeah. there's nowhere to land and there's no food for them. That's why you know later. In uh, which is it eight or nine where he sends out the raven and then he sends out the dove, you know, and they come back and and then when they don't come back, he knows that there's a place for them to land and and place to build a nest. So yeah. Well, wouldn't they have to have sacrifice mm -hmm. when all this comes to an end and yeah. they start repopulating? If all they took was two of everything. Right, and they sacrificed them. You're out of luck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would have to have. yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's that's it. the thing. That's the the one thing probably that comes to our mind first that they needed them for the sacrifices. But as I was studying, I came I came across possibly at least two other uh, for that reason. But all in addition to that, at least two other reasons for them. Hmm. So that, that's that's an interesting question. The part that gave me. Pause <laughs> and have to go back to the King James. Yes, a male and its mate. Yeah, you know King James is clearly male and female. Male and female. And, and if it wasn't for our culture, you probably wouldn't have any trouble with that at all. But I do have, you know, yeah, pause to ponder that. Yeah, if, uh, 
And I even read some different translations in it, a male and yeah, it's male, male and it's female. Yeah. But if you go back to the original, yeah. it's a male yeah. and female. Yeah, when you go back to the original words, that mm -hmm. is what that word is. Of course, uh, yeah, the, as we've talked about before, the difference in, in translations between a word-for-word -word translation and a thought-for-thought -thought translation. A thought-for-thought -thought reads in a more um, a conventional or contemporary way where it has a better flow to it. And so, it, it you know, it's a, and it doesn't repeat the same word over and over and over when you use synonyms. So, but, but the word-for-word -word goes back to the original word, like you said, the King James, back to a male and a female animal. Somebody else start, yeah. Yeah. Um, I got confused, so you have to really help me with this. In all the storybooks about Noah, the animals going on, they're going in twos, and then it comes up in And then there's seven. Yeah, like I'm dancing. So that would be 14, couldn't it? It could be. Yeah. Seven pairs. Seven yeah. pairs, yeah. Seven. Yeah. So, what was it? What, what, well, okay, good good question. Hold that. We'll, we'll get to that, too. I don't want to give all the answers to the question. They don't have any lesson left. So, so what else? Though? What else came up? I wondered why he told them a week in advance. He what do you mean? He, he said, um, in one week, I'm going to begin the 40 days and the 40 nights. Yeah, they went in and, and shut the door and waited inside for that week. They were in, inside with they the door were shut. Inside for a week. Yeah, before the rain started. I mean, think about that for a minute. We'll discuss that more when we get down to okay. that. But, but yeah, they were inside with the door shut for that week. What else? <laughs> Let's just get going. Let's just, let's just get going. Anybody else got anything before we jump in? Oh, <laughs> the question's answered. Can you imagine being 600 years old? 70's bad enough. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And he'd been working on this for 100 years, you know. He was 500 when, when the boys were born. I think about his wife. Uh, I'll, I'll throw this out to you. I didn't put this in the lesson, but I thought this, it kind of struck me as comical. Uh, uh, who was it? Matthew Henry. In Matthew Henry's commentary, he's talking about after, you know, they, they go on the ark, and then after they come off the ark, and he, he said something to the effect of, and we don't get any more uh, account that Noah and his wife had any more children. I, they're 600 years old. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, even if you look back in, in Genesis 5, most of them had their children before they're 600 years old. I mean, give them a break, maybe. <laughs> that just hit me funny. Other thoughts? All right, well, we will just jump in then. So as, as I uh, started on working on this, <clears throat> of course, I, I normally uh, spend all afternoon Sunday afternoon studying. Of course, I had the, the alumni choir concert yesterday, so I, I knew I wasn't going to get Sunday afternoon to study. So I've been working on it even earlier in the week and spent bigger parts of, of the days working on it. And, but, it but as I started, I thought, what can I say about this? I mean, it's just it's just pretty straightforward. And I thought, it's going to be a, a really short lesson. And then I thought, but not to fear. The more I worked on it, the more I realized <laughs> there is so much to learn from this chapter. In fact, as I was working on it, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to leave some stuff out that I had notes on. So we, we'll see how that goes. But coming to chapter 7 of Genesis, as I've said before, there are many different ways to approach these chapters. Well, actually, any scripture in the Bible, not not just these, but any scripture. Uh, a, a preacher, there's there's different ways that, that pastors and preachers prepare sermons. One of those is called textural preaching. T-E-X-T-U-R-A-L, textural preaching. And by that, it means they just take a text of scripture and preach on it. You know, however many verses and uh, and and it'll be different next week than it was. I mean, they don't follow through. It's just this text and then this text and then this text. Or uh, some call that topical preaching. Uh, sometimes they they teach the context of it in the in view of the larger picture, but sometimes not. Sometimes it's just 
that verse and, or verses and whatever, whatever it is. Another approach is expository. Uh, it's spelled E-X-P-O-S-I-T-O-R-Y. And expository preaching is preaching through sections or entire books of the Bible. We do expository teaching. That's the method that we use. We go through, um, we did a little different, of course, for the, uh, the prophets, but we generally go straight through a whole book. So it's expository teaching. And uh, still others will use a combined approach, like two of my favorite uh, online favorite teachers are Andy Woods. I've talked about him often, but I found a new one. His name is Jack Hughes, and he's up up in he's in Kentucky, and like with with Ryan and Molly. I can't even remember if it's Lexington or Louisville, but one of those places. So he he's up in Kentucky, but he's really good. But they they preach on they preach through whole books. But they cover small sections of oh, it. Just what's the second one's name? Uh, Jack Hughes. Jack Hughes. Yeah, yeah. And he, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really enjoying his. I'm going back and listening even to some, some earlier stuff that he did. But what, what they do is similar to what we do in Sunday school, and that is right now we're studying the book of, uh, the book of First Peter. But most weeks we only cover three or four verses. Because there's a lot to say about those verses, uh, uh, the context, of course, but we discuss those verses a lot. Sometimes we go on rabbit trails with those verses, but it's just small bites of the bigger section. So, but I say all that to say that, that in a chapter or a section of scripture like we've been in this year, the, these first 11 chapters of Genesis, there's so many different ways to approach it. For me, and since I'm going doing this, this is the way I do it. I approach the Bible as a historical fact. That, that's, that's what I believe. That's just the way that I approach it. First of all, it's a historical fact. But not everyone believes that. Not everyone thinks that's important. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard in the last two weeks, well, just what difference does it make anyway? Well, it makes a lot of difference, in my opinion, in the, in the way that I teach. And here's why I believe that. I believe it's important because of what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says. The Amplified Bible puts it this way. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose, and action. So that, this is verse 17, so that the man, and the word there means every person, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every word in the Bible is important. As Jesus said in, in, in Matthew 5, talking about the law, every jot and tittle, those were punctuation marks. We could say every apostrophe, every comma. You know, Now, our different translations may put commas in different places, as we saw in, in our Peter, first Peter study this week. But in, in the original manuscripts, every... Gr grammatical use of a word is important. And so I think every word is important. And so that, that's the, that's the way I do it. It's all real. It's all important. And it's all true. That's where I come from. And that's my approach to teaching. So as I've been studying, you know, I study First Peter and I study Genesis every week. So as I've been studying First Peter for our Sunday, uh, study. I ran across something that William Barclay said about Jesus being the redemption for sin. But the way he said it applies here very well. He said, he said that we think of God as having created the world. And then when things went wrong, had to find a redeemer, had to find someone to rescue the world. And so it's a rescued the world through Jesus Christ. But what he said then was, he said, God was redeemer before he was creator. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's right. He, because we, he based this, of course, on first, 
1 Peter 1, verse 20. Ephesians 1, verse 4, and especially Revelation 13, verse 8, which speaks of the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Before everything, anything, before anything was created in chapter 1, the plan of redemption was already in place. It was, it was already, as we would say, a done deal. So, but as I read that, I thought of what we're studying in Genesis. It wasn't that God created everything and found that it was very good and then just as soon as man fell, God was scrambling, you know, come up with a plan B, you know, what, what am I going to do now? They, they've messed it up. And then it got worse and he had to completely erase the chalkboard or, or the, the whiteboard and start all over again. No, that was already the plan. He already knew that. God knew this before man ever drew his first breath. And it was a breath that God gave him at that. So, but, but here we are. Chapter 6 told us in verses 5 through 7, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent, every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he'd made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out, that, that word just means to erase, Scrub clean. I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I made them. So that was in that section, in that total dot. In the next section, in the next total dot, we read it again. Verses 11 through 13. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of God. And the earth was filled with violence. By the way, I'm going to throw this out for those who hadn't heard this before. The Hebrew word for violence is Hamas. Wow. Just, really? Just, wow. yes, it is. That's the Hebrew word for violence. So the earth was filled with violence. And, and, God, and God looked at the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, the, the flesh that's in the earth. Behold, I'm about to destroy them along with the earth. So, uh, and by the way, I've, I've got to throw this out too. I, I made a mistake in, in last week's lesson. I was mistaken when I said that God was going to destroy everything that was created on the sixth day. Well, he did destroy everything that was on the sixth day, but the birds were created on the fifth day. So you can you can make that. Now, I, I missed that one completely. So the birds as well. But and, and as I was thinking about it, it's everything that has the breath of life in it. Everything with a conscious life. And yes, believe it or not, birds have personalities. Anybody ever have a pet what, parakeet or no? My uh, daughter on Suzanne's parents had this, I don't know what kind of bird this is, African something or another, Zulu, believe me, Zulu has a personality, so, but I've forgotten about that, but but anyway, the birds were on the fifth day, so, so God was already, was going to destroy everything that had the breath of life in it, but God also had a plan, already had a plan in place to show mercy and grace, not only to man, but to the animals, in fact, in verses 19 and 20 of, of chapter 6, he says twice that the reason for bringing the animals onto the ark is to keep them alive. That's in chapter 6. So we know from Scripture that God is slow to anger. We know that God will relent, or as the King James puts it, uh, repent of judgment when repentance is shown. Yeah, we, we think about... Um, Think about Jonah. You know, God was going to destroy Nineveh, but they repented. Therefore, God didn't do that, you know, much to Jonah's chagrin. But 1 Peter 3, verse 20, which actually is speaking about this section of Scripture in Genesis, tells us that the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. While Noah is building, his sons are building, you know, whatever his wife and daughters-in-law were doing, God was patient during the construction of the ark. I thought, man, that's, 
You know, we read over those things sometimes and don't really grasp the importance of that. And, and, and so that's right where we are this week in chapter 7. So God was patient. How patient was God? Well, verse 3 of chapter 6 tells us that he waited 120 years. I mean, we don't know how long this, this intermarrying or this, this uh, thing was going on, but we know that there came a point when he said, I'll give you 120 years until the destruction comes. All the time Noah was building, he was preaching, and God was patient. So now, coming to chapter 7, God's patience has run out. But, but stepping back a bit to the building of the ark, we talked last time about the reasons that God had Noah build the ark. And we read the directions that God gave Noah in verses 14 through 16 of chapter 6. And then God said what he was going to do in verse 17 of chapter 6. And then in verse 18, he said, But I... God said, but I will establish my covenant with you, speaking to Noah, and you uh, with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And here, the covenant was promised, but no details given. Noah doesn't have a clue what this covenant's going to involve. If we read this like we don't know what's going to happen next, we don't have a clue what this covenant's going to involve. Just the fact that God said, I will, uh, I will establish my covenant with you. It's a promise. And get this, the promise was given before the first board of the ark was cut. And then, and then we read what Noah was to do in the rest of chapter 6 once the ark was finished. So over and over through scripture we see this pattern. You need to watch for this pattern. We see God giving directions for something, and then we see it happening. That, that's all throughout uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's all throughout there. Uh, when, when they're building the tabernacle, when they're creating the clothing for the priest, when doing, uh, God says what it's going to do, what it's going to look like, what it, and then they do it. But the, the best known one, uh, that, the one that we know better, is uh, comes in... Um, in chapter 12 of Exodus, where God gives all the directions for the Passover. The first part of chapter 12, he tells them exactly how to do it, detail by detail. And the second part of chapter 12, they do it. And that pattern repeats, as I said, over and over and over again. Uh, and, and so we see it happening here. There, there are many other examples, as I said, as well. Verse 22, though, of chapter 6 tells us, Thus Noah did... Everything he was told to do, Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. So, but but here's what we have to remember, you know, because we read through Scripture and we're reading one chapter and then we read the next chapter. There's about a hundred years that passes between the end of chapter six and the beginning of chapter seven. You, you got to realize, you got to understand that there's about a hundred years between the end of chapter six and the beginning of chapter seven, because this is a real historical event. If you've ever been involved in a building project, you know what goes into it. Yeah, yeah. years, and years. <laughs> we built our house from the cutting of the logs to the sawing of the lumber to the building of the house. Everybody in our family, except Joe's mother, put at least one nail. In the, we, we made sure, well, I kept trying to get on the to just drive one nail so I can say everybody did. <laughs> kids did. I mean, the kids were little. We, we all did. But, but, but you're right, years, and we, we're still all finished. But, but think about all the things that have to happen to build a structure. Imagine the sights. Imagine the sounds. Imagine the smells as the animals start gathering. Some of the commentaries that I was reading and, and the videos that I watched went, went into great detail about the ark, how much the structure could hold, the cubic feet involved in it, the shape, the size, how much it could hold. The, uh, I, I've got it in my notes, but I didn't write it down here. The, the equivalency between the ark and and however many boxcars of a train. 
I mean, like something like 400 box cars of a train cubic feet. Yeah, you know, and, and then it talked about the ratio, the length to width to height, the ratio so that it could write out the, the, the waves. Well, whatever this ratio is, they said it could tip almost 90 degree over and, and then write itself. I mean, fascinating stuff. And I thought, well, you know, it, it did happen. I'm not going to go into all that because I'd just be copying and pasting all that. But, but those, I can, I can give you links to that stuff if you want that. But for, for this study, I'm simply going on the fact of the word of God said it happened. And it happened just like he said. Can you imagine? No chainsaws and no nail guns. Right. I mean, oh man, we live by no the nail guns. Uh, yeah, just by hand. Well, they didn't have plumb lines, so it's sort of like a level. That's I guess. all, though. Yeah. That's all. Well, we, we could go down a rabbit trail of, there's a couple of teachers that I know that think the technology of that era was way more advanced than, than we think it was. And it, and it probably was. But, but the, the fact of the matter is, is it happened. It was built, God gave the directions, God gave the ratio, God gave the size, and it happened. Did they have nails? I don't know. They may have. Remember, I say, who was it? One of one of Cain's descendants was, was a forger oh, of oh. iron. Yeah. So they may they may have had nails. You know, we think of they had wooden pigs, but they yeah. may have had nails. One of somebody, I don't remember who it was now that I was I don't know if I was reading or watching. But talked about it, that the boards probably went horizontal and then vertical and then horizontal again. You know, there were thicknesses. I, I don't know. But there, there's a lot of speculation there. But, but you know, it, and it is important to know some of these things. Now, now, for us, it may not be important because we believe it. But you need to at least know where to find those things. Because, as Andy Woods often says, your children and your grandchildren are watching the History Channel and the mysteries of the Bible. You need to know where to find. And, and like Don uh, brought this this book. Anybody wants to read this book, you're you're welcome to take it and read it. But you talk about detail. What was it? The, the cataclysmic hydrological words I can't even say. But anyway, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but 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 you know. It, it, Many people want to be convinced, though, before they will believe. The, the, you you got to give them the facts and, and the and the details before they will believe. The Bible says that we have to believe first, and then we know the truth. You, do you remember what Jesus told Thomas when when Thomas wanted to see? He said, "Blessed, blessed are are those who have what believe. not seen believe. and yet believe." believe. Right. So, our uh, the, there are facts there. We'll talk about facts a little bit later. But but the flood was supernatural. It was beyond natural. But then there's so many other things about the Bible that are beyond natural. But then the day came. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time or in this generation. I don't know how many times you've read this chapter this week or uh, if you've read it in different translations. I, I really hope you've read it several times or at least more than once. And I, and I didn't ask this earlier, but let me ask this now. If you read it, even if you just read it once, but especially if you read it more than once, what words jumped out at you that were repeated? Did, did any words jump out at you that were repeated? The more I read it, the more words jumped out at me. Out at me that were repeated. Take. Take. Yeah. Take. Take this, take that, yeah. take the other. Yeah. 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 Are you, can you spot any right off? Is everybody reading right quick? The water prevailed. The water prevailed. The water prevailed. Water prevailed. That's that's a that's a big one too. That's important. God commanded God to do this, that. Do this, that, and the other. Exactly. For me, uh, as I was, uh, I, I would, for one of, the, one of the ones, the first one to jump out at me was the number of times that the word all was used. You see, all used a lot, especially in the, in the middle part. And it's really there more than you may think, especially if you're if you're using a more contemporary translation, because the, 
I actually didn't know, I noticed all a lot, but I didn't notice how often it was used until I started reading in my uh, word study Bible, which has all of the Greek and Hebrew, or in this case Hebrew, numbers. And I noticed how many times that particular number was showing up. I'm like, whoa, it's in there a lot more times than, than I thought it was. There so, is a lot of all. There is a lot of all. <laughs> when you just start looking for them through and circling six, them. And, six and 15. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's just right after mm-hmm. the other. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, that scripture that I quoted earlier from Second Timothy, when it says that all scripture is God-breathed, that's the Greek equivalent word. It's all. The word means all, every, complete, everything. So, you know, as our, as our English teachers taught, you know, you don't use the same word over and over. It gets redundant. So you got to use a synonym. Not, but that word, I, I'd like to have a Bible that actually uses the, the words and, and so you can see them every time instead of, instead of hunting for them. But, but an, another word that is important is the word enter. Enter the ark. The NIV and the New Living Translation say go into the ark. They don't use the word enter. But here again, the King James Version is best because here in the King James it says, and the Lord said, come thou and all thy family into the ark. Now what difference do you see when someone says go into the house versus come into the house? They're They're already there. Exactly. God said come into the ark. He didn't say go into the ark. He said come into the ark. The the Hebrew word is a verb that can be used in a lot of different ways depending on the tense of the word. But back in chapter 8, excuse me, chapter 6 verse 18, when God said thou shalt come into the ark, or the New New American Standard says uh, you shall enter the ark, but the word there is come. When, when he said, thou shalt come into the ark, the tense there is a simple statement. He's giving them directions. I will establish my covenant with you. You shall come into the ark, you and, and your family. It's a, it's a simple statement. This is, this is what you are to do. But here in verse 1 of chapter 7, the tense of the word come is an imperative. Linda, are you our only teacher in the group? What's an imperative? A command. A command. Do this. It's not, you ought to think about it. It's a do this. You are to do this. You are to, it, it's an imperative coming from the one speaking. In this case, the Lord. Where else in Scripture, just, just to think about this off the top of your head, where else in Scripture do we find the Lord saying, Come? What what in Scripture do you think of when when the Lord or Jesus says, Come? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy. That one comes to us quickly. Think of any others. I I didn't look up the word to see if it was the same word, but I think of the call of Abraham to come and, and go to this new place. My favorite one is in... Uh, John 1 verse, I mean, I love that one because I, I quote that one a lot. But in John 1 verse 39, you remember the story, uh, John and, and Andrew are disciples of John the Baptist. And, and Jesus comes through and John the Baptist says, you know, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So John and Andrew go to Jesus and ask him where he's staying. Does anybody remember what Jesus said? Now come and see. That, that whole chapter is filled with that oh, yeah. phrase many times. Come and see. Come and see. They go and tell, tell who is it, uh, Bartholomew or somebody. And, and we found the Messiah. Come and see. I, mean, I, I love that. Well, in Revelation full of that. Exactly. That, that's what, that was going to be my next comment. The first call to the Lord, uh, that the Lord says to come is here in chapter 7, verse 1. But the last one, is in Revelation 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. So from Genesis to Revelation, it, it, it's come. It, it's every, and it's everywhere in between. God took the initiative with Adam when he said, Where are you? He took the initiative with Cain when he said, Sin is crouching at your door. And now with Noah, and when the ark is finished, he says, Come into the ark. 
So another thing that was really interesting to me, and I don't know if you picked up on it. I didn't even pick up on this till last night. Uh, how many times I'd read it. And I knew some things were repeated, but I didn't pick up exactly how it was until last night. How many times the same account is given in this same chapter? I, I, it, it just blew me away. The first time, the first giving of the account is in verses 1 through 6. Noah and his family are told, come into the ark. The second time is in verses 7 through 12, where he says, um, uh, then Noah and his sons and his, his wife and his son's wife with him came, uh, came, came in to the ark or entered the ark because of the water of the flood. And then a third time, in verses 13 through 24, exactly the same story. Details change, but the, the account is the same. And on the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, Noah's wife and the three wives of, of his sons with them, came in to the ark. And it tells the same thing every time. Why do you think it's recorded that? Why are there three givings of the same account? I mean, like I said, there's some details that are different, but why? Why couldn't they have just combined all the details into one seamless, straight-through account? Well, sometimes when you repeat yourself, you're wanting to make it. It's, a, it's an emphasis. Right, right. It, it, it is that. You don't think they were hesitating, do you? No, I, I don't think that was it. I, I think this this involves the account of it. Th this is more for those who would read it later. Because right. in all three versions of this, they go in, come in, and they and they do. Sort of like the gospel. Everybody's got their own account. That that could very well be. That thought didn't hit me uh, until way. It, 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 in fact, today. As I was was working on it, so so but but now the ark is finished. Let me make sure I got. Yeah. So so now the ark is finished, and the Lord said, "Come." And we know that with the building of the ark, that Noah and his sons, and and probably the women too, were in and out of the ark many times. You know, you're carrying stuff in, and you're working, and you know, you're in and out of it day in and day out. But they never went in to stay until God told them to. And and, and think about this. When, when God said this, coming to the ark, there was not a cloud in the sky. No sign that anything was going to happen. But what they did? They, they, they obeyed it. They, they went in. So we read verse 1 again. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come in, enter the ark, you and all your household. For you alone, I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. Or that that phrase there is in this generation. Now this is a, this is a different word for generation. This is not total dot. This is a generation meaning a specific group of people. Of all the people that are living in the day of Noah, you alone were righteous. And, and we saw that back in uh, in, in chapter six. Somewhere, I don't spot it right off. But we, we saw that back in chapter 6. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And and here here's where a preacher could take this and expand on it and make a whole sermon out of this. It is the fact that Noah's immediate family was saved because of Noah's righteousness. Because Noah was the only one found in his generation. Now, Noah was looked upon as the head of household. Remember, God called Adam, even though Eve was the one that sinned first. God called Adam because Adam was the head of household. Noah is representative of the head of household. So he alone in his generation was, was found to be righteous. But, but still, each one of the others had to decide to come or not. But they, they I imagine had had the freedom to back out and say, no, I'm not going to do it. But each one of them came into the ark just like Noah did. We think about the uh, the Philippian jailer in in uh, Philipp, uh, Acts 16. You know, Paul and Silas are in jail. Paul and Silas sang all night long. 
and, and there was the earthquake and, and the jailer thought they'd escape. He's about to kill himself and, and, and they, oh, no, no, we're, we're here, we're here. And then the jailer cries out, but of course, because he'd been hearing them singing, been hearing them preaching, and he cries out, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas answer him and say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, he wasn't saved for his household. But because of him, because of his coming to salvation, the gospel came to the household. If he hadn't been saved, the gospel would have never come to that household. And, and we're told that, that Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord to him, that jailer, with all who were in his house. They all heard the message, and they were all then baptized because they individually came to faith. They weren't saved because he was saved or or on his coattails, we might say, but it is, was because of him, because the gospel came there, but they each had to make that, that, that decision, that call. So Noah's family wasn't saved just because Noah was. They all each had to come. And so, but now think about this. Think about what they had to leave behind. Now, we're not told, the only thing we're told that they took was the animals and food. Did they, it, you know, of course, you imagine a gangplank. I'm sure there was some kind of a incline that they went up to enter into. Did they ever stop and look back? Think about Lot's wife, you know, look back. I, I, I'm, I'm with you, Kat. I don't think they did, but you, you think about think about what was going through their mind. What were they leaving behind? We, we, we don't know what Noah owned. We don't know if he was wealthy. But it's likely that he had, had some sort of wealth to either own the land to have the trees to cut or the wealth to buy the wood. I mean, you, you, if you've ever built anything, that, that, they're not giving it away. You know, even if you own the land like, like we did, still there's the expense of, you know, or the sweat equity that goes into it. So we, we don't know what he had, but we know that he would need tools, whether it was, you know, some kind of a nailer or nails or pegs or saw, what, whatever. He had to have some kind of tools of the trade. I got, as I was studying now, I got to thinking about my tools of the trade. You know, mo mostly books, uh, uh, laptop, internet, things that are available, uh, you know, farm equipment. Anything you do requires the tools of your trade. But when you were doing framing, you had specific tools. Oh, yeah. You had specific Much tools. more specific tools. Mm -hmm. Some of them I still have, but can't get rid of them. But, you know. <laughs> But, but here, oftentimes on social media, or you will hear in conversation, someone will say, if your house was burning and you could only grab one thing, what would it be? Not counting family, of course. You could grab, I mean, think about that. If you could only grab one thing, what's the most valuable thing in your house that you would grab? No, it didn't, they, they couldn't take anything. And, and think about this. When they entered the ark, they had no idea how long they would be in there. They didn't know when or if they were ever coming out of it. All that God, God never told them, we're going to do this and then I'm going to bring you back out. That's some incredible faith. Yeah. And you're in there with all them animals and we're, the smell. The smell. <laughs> and we're never coming out. I mean, Way up. Whether you got enough food to last? Yeah. How not? how much food are we going to need? You know, it there's... says bring in enough food. Yeah. For all your how much is and enough? All the animals. Yeah. How much? How much is enough? People say, well, I've got you know, I've got six weeks worth of food put back, or I've got a year's worth of food, or I've got a you know, whatever amount of food. So you've got a year's worth of food. What are you going to do on day 366? Maybe it was like olive oil that never ran out. It may be. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it very well. I didn't think about that story, the oil that never ran out. Mm -hmm. uh, that The uh, uh, Elisha and the widow, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the oil and the meal that never ran out. So you know, that, that's just one of those things to think about. So, so here, the first account is what I call the bare bones account, verses 1 through 6. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take, 
There's that word. You shall take with you of every, same word as all, take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. Also of the birds of the sky, by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I, excuse me, I will blot, I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out, same word he used there in chapter six, erase, scrub clean, I will blot out from the face of the land of every, all, living thing I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Uh, and then verse 6, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. So, okay, now to the animals. What are clean and unclean animals? This is the first time in Scripture that there is a mention of a distinction. And like Kay said, we, if we don't have the scripture in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we don't even have a clue what that's supposed to mean. Well, what did it mean here? Did it mean the same thing that that uh, that Moses told them about? And, and why? Why clean and unclean animals? It has to do with the blood. It has to do with the blood. It has to do with with sacrifice. We talked a little bit about, it. and as I said, that's always the first thing that comes to mind, but. That's a lot of sacrifices. So, I, I, and I think this is this is my opinion on this. I think this is another hint that they knew what worship was. I think we were we've been given clues of that all the way through from chapter three that they know what worship is and they know what worship involves. So, a, another thought that that is related to that though, and that is that. Because many animals would be needed for sacrifice, therefore they would need to reproduce quicker. You'd have more of them reproducing in order to have the number that you needed for the sacrifices. But here's another thought, and that is that the clean animals would be needed for food. Now they don't know that yet. We don't, we don't know that until we get to chapter 9 when they're told to eat of, of meat. Up until this time, they're eating the same thing they took in for the animals. But, but they, the clean animals would be needed for food, therefore they needed to have a number of them to reproduce. Uh, as I said, they don't know that now. But, but here, it's interesting, in, in all those clean animals, there are no crawling animals listed in the clean animals. Now, they'll take the crawling ones, you know, within the, the two-by-twos, but the crawling ones are not listed in clean animals. And, and Henry Morse added another thought. He said that perhaps some of the clean animals were for domestication. For some reason, they, they needed some of them to be gentler than the others. I, I, I don't know. There's just many different reasons other than just for sacrifices. But but here to your question that y'all had, how many clean animals are there? Some commentaries and teachers interpret verses two and three as there are seven sets of clean animals, making fourteen animals. Others interpret it as seven total clean animals. Hmm. And Karen, I hadn't had a chance to listen to those at uh, I don't, I don't know if that DVD will go into that part or not, but I'd, I'd be interested. Well, do, does he say anything in, in the Bible there uh, in his notes about uh, the number, however many there were? That would be uh, uh, verse 3. Okay. Uh, so, in fact, I'd never heard the thought that there were seven total. But the thought behind that is, is that uh, there is a picture, the picture that they see in that, or the allegory, the picture, is that God gave six ordinary days and one extra one that's special, set aside. So therefore there are six, three sets, of ordinary animals with one extra. To me that seems like a little bit of a stretch, uh, but, and I had always read it as seven sets thinking it was 14. And if, if you're talking about the fact that you need a lot more of them to reproduce, I think you need more than three sets. You know, normally you'd have 
for you to have one set, but so, I, so what you're saying is you think that they, they had sacrifices throughout the entire flood? No, no, flood? no, no. Just there at the I, end. They're they're just just there at the end. But the reason that they have seven sets or fourteen seven of each male and female, of the clean animals is because once they get off the ark, then it, we know there's a sacrifice right then. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've only got one set and you kill one of them, then you're out of luck. So so you, you at least need, like I said, the, the three sets. But because there were basically four families, uh, eight people, the scripture says eight souls, eight people, you'd need eight of something, for your sacrifice, like we saw with Cain and Abel, you needed a something for your sacrifice. However, often those sacrifices were to be, if that was a weekly thing, you know, it's going to take a lot. Yeah. But even if it's not weekly, it's going to take, you need that many for them to start reproducing so that you have the flocks and you have the herds that you're going to need ongoing. Yeah, but they were only in the ark for like a year. A year. Mm -hmm. And... No, the rabbits reproduce pretty quick. <laughs> no, no, and and I don't. And personally, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure if it, if it will say anything about this in chapters eight and nine. I've not studied them that close yet. My opinion is is that they don't. Re, none of them reproduces on the ark. Right. That they don't start reproducing until they're off of the ark. Mm -hmm. But at that point on, then they're going going to need this many of them mm -hmm. okay. reproducing, okay. Fill, filling the ark. And that's why I had always heard that. Very young animals went on the ark rather than older, mature animals because More then, out. because then when they got off, they would be able to reproduce. Yeah, yeah. And not only did they take up less space, but then right. then they they would reproduce quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that that's my thought on that. But uh, so, like I said, I, I'd always read it as seven sets, and and so that's that's what I think it is. But so so here we are, Noah and his family are to come in. And, and verse 2 says, take animals. Take the animals too. But now, verse 4, um, it's going to be seven more days before the rain starts. So so uh, verse 4, so, so they go in through verse 3. Verse 4, for after seven days, I will send rain on the earth and 40 days and 40... 40 nights and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I've made. So they're in there and it's going to be seven more days before the rain starts. Um, Perry put a note here saying that most scholars believe that that gave time for Noah to grieve his great grandfather Methuselah who had died. Yeah, that that was one of, one of the things that I read. Uh, that that's one that we don't often think about because Methuselah is not mentioned anymore after chapter five. But if you but if you follow the chronology, you know that he died just uh, just a, a week or so before, before so the before the flood started. So that that's one possibility because when Joseph dies in uh, in chapter fifty of Exodus, they grieve him for seven weeks. For seven I mean, days. Uh, seven days. So, so that's that's one possibility. But, but, but think about this. What, what, what other reasons? What's, what's up with waiting seven days before the rain starts? Or could that was God showing mercy, giving people one final one more chance, chance. One, more one more final opportunity? One of the commentaries said maybe it was they were they were getting last minute things done on the ark and getting the animals and the people situated getting the food distributed and everything ready i, I kind of I, I would put that way down on my list of possibilities mm -hmm. i my thing and, and middle ways of my possibilities would be grieving methuselah but i think top on, on my list of possibilities would be that one more chance mm -hmm. to repent when you think about jesus uh speaking to to judas when you know, every time he has an interaction with Judas from the Last Supper all the way down to when Judas comes up and, and brings the guard in and he kisses him on the cheek, is one more chance, one more chance to repent. And I, and I think that's that's my belief. It's one more chance to to repent. But think about it. And obviously, no one did. No, no one did. Did, did God close the door? 
And then that's when they stayed in there for seven days? Yeah. So I, I think we see that from, from the next uh, section. But and, and you're right. You know, maybe they couldn't after that time once the door shut. Yeah. But, but apparently they didn't show any inkling yeah. to. But what do you think is going on outside while no one his family is inside with the door shut and there's no clouds and there's nothing happening? It's a party yeah. outside. Yeah. It's a party. It's a mocking. It's hecklers. It's going around. You imagine meeting on the side. Hey, you and you know, all of that's going on. It's been 120 years of Noah preaching. Something like 100 years to build the ark. And now seven more days. But it didn't awaken anyone. Now, our pastor here is going through Revelation, but one thing I noticed when, when we studied it as a group, when we studied it verse by verse, was that even in the most catastrophic times, those who, as, as Revelation says over and over and over, dwell on the earth, who's, the earth is their home, they never repented. Never repented. And none repent here either. In fact, in, and this is how I know that that uh, no one offered to repent. And that is because in Luke 17, verse 27, Jesus tells us that they were doing everything they'd been doing right up until the flood came. The, the big fat drops start falling and they're still partying. What is this? Doing all this stuff, yeah. 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 In fact, that was a question I had. What? Now, did they even know what rain was? And so I did some searching on the word rain, and the word rain literally just means falling from the sky. It doesn't say what's falling from the sky, but something began to fall from the sky. And, and so then we're told in this first section about the duration of the rain. The number 40, of course, is used in Scripture to indicate a time of testing, but this is a fact. I think a time of testing is incidental to that it's a fact. It's a, a literal 40 days and 40 nights that it rained. And then verse 5, uh, And Noah did, all, according to all that the Lord had commanded him. And, and you know, we said, if you look at these Tola dots or these sections as being written by whoever it's it started out, you know, the records of Abraham and then the, the records of uh, of Noah and then the records of the generations of Noah and then uh, the, the Shem, Ham, and Japheth. If it's written by them, we don't know if, uh, uh, if, if the sons of Noah added this in uh, as, as a, as a date marker, verse, I'm talking about verse six. Now, Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. We don't know if Noah wrote that in, if, uh, the sons added that as a date marker, if Moses perhaps added this in as a bit of commentaries. We, we've, we've seen Moses, I believe, add things like this in before, but Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. But it's assumed because he was 500 years old at the end of chapter 6. Yeah. And if he builds the ark for 100 years. Yeah. Well, no, we, we get the fact that it's 100 years because he is 600 years. Yeah. So it, it's reverse of that until we get the 100 years. But, but yeah, so it, that, it's a marker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but yeah, I, I think that this, this marks the seriousness of the moment. This is it. The old way's over. It's really happening. But then, in verses 7 through 12, we get a second account of the same event. And it came to me as I, today as I was studying this, writing this down, I thought, oh, you know, one of those times that the light bulb goes off, and you go, aha, we have three accounts, and we have three sons. I wonder, was this each of their version you know, just like you said earlier, the four Gospels, is this each of the three sons' versions of this account? They're all the same, but they're all a little bit different. So, I, I don't know, I, that, I just found that really interesting. But for whatever reason, we have a little bit more detail now. Look at verses 7 through, tw uh, through 10. Then, then Noah and his sons and his wife, his son's wife, with him entered the ark. Picking back up with verse 1. 
because of the water and the flood was coming. Look at it. Of the clean animals and the animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground. Now we know we get, we get the creeping animals. That's an, or creeping things. That's a separate or an additional detail. And these went into the ark. Noah didn't take them. Uh, back in, in chapter uh, 6, it says, uh, take for yourself. Take the ark or take the animals. Now it says the animals went. Noah didn't have to make them go. They, they went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God has commanded Noah. And it came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. And in the, the let's see, um, okay, let's, let's stop right there. Uh, so the animals went in. And then we have a really important detail in verses 11 and 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were open and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Many of the details are the same, but we have some additional details now. Someone must have said, write that date down. That's an important date. The, the 600th year, the second month, the 17th day. Now, we don't know how dates were figured at that time. Was this counted forward from creation week? And it would have been that amount of time, like the number of years of all of them in chapter 5. Was this, when Noah was 600 years, 2 months and 17 days old, I don't know, was it dependent on his age? Did Moses correspond the dates to the Jewish calendar? And if so, was it the civil calendar or the religious calendar? Mm -hmm. we, we just don't know. If it was the civil calendar, then the, when this happened, it would have been around the 1st of November. If it was the religious calendar, it would have been around the 1st of May. But we just don't know. But whatever it is, it's important enough that God had the date recorded. And here's why I think the date was recorded. Only real things get dates. Yeah, why bother if it's yeah, not real? Yeah, why bother if it's not real? Have you ever noticed the parables that Jesus tells? Only, uh, only parables are spoke of in, or let me put it back, nobody is given a name in a parable. The rich man and Lazarus, I think that's a real account because they have names. But every parable that Jesus gives, nobody gets a name and we don't get a date. Now, <coughs> Luke many times will say a certain time or a certain, but generally when Luke does that, he's talking about a real event. But but I think I think it's important that it got a date because it was real. But, but at any rate, the rest of uh, verse 11, uh, the, on the same day, uh, that they that all this took on, on this date, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the skies were open, and the rain fell on the earth for forty days and forty nights. And here we have all that we know about the flood, about how it happened. This, this is all we know from Scripture about how it happened. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you can go into a, a lot of different things, but. But this is all we really, aside from a few poetic verses in, in Job and in the Psalms, this is all we know. But like we said about creation, there are all kinds of ways that God could have done it. But what did he say that he did? This is what he said that he did, and he deemed this was all we needed to know about it. But, but that, does, that doesn't stop us, of course, from speculating and some commentaries especially uh, Morris here and, and they have this whole separate book just on the flood but he goes into detail about how it could have happened but but this, the scripture first says the fountains of the great deep burst open so, so perhaps the sequence went something like this first something under the earth began to rumble before anything happens in the sky an earthquake maybe or some shaking or rumbling starts going on with, within the earth. And then maybe volcanoes, because of the earthquakes, volcanoes are caused to allow the heat 
and the magma to come up from out of the middle of the earth. So they begin erupting. When they erupt, what does it send into the sky? Ash and magma, which then affects this firmament or this canopy, which causes the waters to turn loose from above. That makes logical sense in the way, exactly in the way that the scripture says it, from the deep to the sky. And then, and then it comes down. And th this was not, this was not just a gentle rain on a tin roof, you know, like we all love to hear. I mean, this was torrents and torrents of water. And it went on for 40 days and 40 nights. And remember, when it started, they didn't know it was going to be 40 days and 40 nights. They had no idea how long this was going to go on. They couldn't, like, have a calendar, you know, and mark off the days till this is going to be over. They had no clue. And God didn't talk to them. No, no. And he didn't give them these details. So we know this... <coughs> This was all written down afterward when they give the accounts of it, but no, they didn't know what was going to happen. So they needed to know. This is what, 40 days, 40 nights. It's all throughout the Bible. Yeah. Well, the, as I said earlier, the, uh, uh, the number 40 indicates a time of testing. Okay. Uh, Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, Elijah was 40 days um, uh, on the mountain when he, when he left Jezebel. Uh, um, Moses was 40 days on the mountain. Is this the first 40 days? This is the first, I think so, yeah. This this would be, have been the first section of 40, 40, of a 40 day increment. Now, that's what, that's what it has come to mean because that's what happened every time. But it's not, the number 40 wasn't given because it's a time of testing. It's a time of testing because it happened for 40 days and 40 nights. <coughs> so, and, 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 and let, me, let me just throw out this weird thought. You know, sometimes when I'm studying, I get these weird thoughts. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I wonder, just, I wonder if the emptying of the waters of the deep created the space for the bottomless pit. Well, I think, I think of the, the springs of the great deep is like the destruction of creation. Yeah. And then the waters washed it all away. But, well, but yeah, the waters washed everything away that was on the earth. Mm -hmm. But you take underneath the earth where the streams were, when they emptied out, it would have left a space. Like a, like a chasm, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I just thought, ooh, but, yeah. But remember, were they locked in there? Yeah. Like, they're locked in there. It's yeah. dark. Because that third account is pretty descriptive. Like, did, did they see those springs? I mean, for, No, no, no. Know, because if you're hearing it, but you don't know what any of this is, I don't know that I would know what that that would be yeah see know. you're you're right no they didn't know that which you know whether it's one of the three sons or whether it's it's Noah that's writing this account down later we don't know or or Moses that God revealed to him how this flood took place you know what the sequence of events mm -hmm. what caused it all all they knew was the torrent of rain coming down out of the sky or the the, the liquid the water coming down out of the sky but at some point either either it was it was revealed to them or revealed to Moses that this was the sequence of events but no they wouldn't have known where that came from this would have had to have been written down and again these accounts were written down afterward after after it's all over but they don't know. You're right. It's dark. They don't know where it's coming from. They just hear this coming. And there's only one window, which is probably more. I mean, they probably it, yeah. It's, it's probably it doesn't doesn't it say? Um, Let's see, eighteen inches. It's yeah. It's uh, I thought it said something about a a window. Finish it to a cubit, eighteen inches on the top, and then set the door. And it doesn't say that there's a a cut. You know. I'll have to look, but I seem I seem to think seem to remember when it says construct an opening all the way around the boat. Mine says that really in verse um, sixteen of chapter six. 
Is it what the constructed? Well, my my mine just around says about eighteen inches below the roof. Mine says you shall make a window hmm. for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top. And and we we'll see next time, and I'll, I'll study closer in in chapters eight and nine. I seem to remember uh, when when the raven. Um, okay, the since the raven out, and and, and then uh, since the dove out. I thought it said something about closing it up when they came back. I don't know. I'll, I'll have to. I'll have to read that closer and see. But I don't. I don't know if there's a covering. For, but anyway, if it's only eighteen inches from the top, depending on how much of an eave or overhang there is, you know, the, the rain may may have not may or may not have been coming in. But it, but anyway, you take a a, a a structure that size and only one window, and even if it just even if it does have it all, still that's not that's not much light. So. You know what I thought about? I thought about all the people that died. Okay, so did the fish have a heyday? I don't know. All the, May know, have. Eat, but, know, yeah. Eat all the... Well, you know, when the, when the eagles and the vultures and were all, when they were all released, they probably had a heyday too. Yeah, you know, I mean, and then when the waters receded, was there like a bunch of... Um, you know, well, you know that that's how that's how the uh, stuff, you uh, know, well with nasty. the amount of sediment that that came, that's where fossils came from mm -hmm. because it was sudden and catastrophic. You know, it wasn't that some anything had time to decay; they were suddenly true, pressing true. in to the Indeed, sediment. That was chapter eight, verse nine about the window. Good, what's it? Uh, he so the window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven. Mm-hmm. And it and it flew and then and then he set out a dove and the dove came back and I thought it said something about when it came back they closed it but but I guess I guess not so however however the window was we don't really know but so but anyway that's uh huh? but they were in the dark for forty days yeah like, yeah it, it would it would have been dark it seemed like there'd be enough oxygen. Just one small window. You would think, yeah. Well, it says here too. And all that methane. Well, yeah. He says Noah lifted back the cover to look. You know, like that's in chapter eight, verse thirteen. Noah lifted back the cover to look. The water was drying up. That's fine. Okay. Hey, here we go. Here, here we go. Jan, Jan found it in uh, in chapter eight, verse thirteen. Uh, when the uh, says that Noah removed the covering of oh that would have been the, that would have been I don't know if that's the door or that's the window. See that's what, I don't know what the cover is. But anyway, he removed that and saw that the that the surface was dried up. So mm -hmm. anyway, anyway, we'll, we'll get to that yeah, next we'll time. To that. But that's something you yeah. gotta find out next week. Yeah, but <laughs> so now so now we've had the first account, we've had the second account, and now we'll get a third account, and a third account uh, the the same event, and again. Even more details, or this time though, it's not so much details as it is emphasis or superlatives. Watch for the superlatives. Verse 13 begins on the very same day. Now, this is not speaking of the same day of verse 11. This is the, the same day with um, uh, verse 7 and verse 1. It's, it's the entering of the ark on the, on the same day. They, they all went into the ark on the same day, is what it's saying. And Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of the sons with them entered the ark. So then in verses 14 through 24, watch for these, these emphasis or these superlatives. Then, uh, in verse 14, they and all or every beast after its kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind and all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark. Uh, to, to, they went to Noah. They, again, he didn't call for them. They, they went to him. And they went by twos. Of all, of all, there it is again, all flesh in which was the breath of life. And those that came in, male and female, of all flesh came in as God has had commanded him, commanded Noah. And the Lord closed it, the, the door, behind him. Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days, and the water increased. Now we're getting more details. 
the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. And then here you go, okay, and the water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark floated on the surface of the water. And the water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. Whichever one of the sons wrote this one was, was a stickler for details. And the water, or it was dramatic, and the water prevailed, verse 20, 15 cubits higher and the mountains were covered. And all flesh that moved on the earth perished. Birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. I mean, how many times can you say that? Verse 22, and all that was on the dry land and all in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. As we said earlier, everyone died. And remember, Moses had brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews. Uh, I, I just can't imagine. I wonder if that's on and on. He goes on and on. Well, yeah. I wonder if that's that week that he was in there, I wonder if he was mourning them. I well, mean, they hadn't lost. died yet. No, but, but I mean, mourning, they, it, it could yeah. have been. They could, it could have been part of it. But but if we pick back up uh, uh, verse 22, no, verse 23, thus he, it would be God, blotted out, wiped away, scarred every, every living thing that was on the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out Again, saying the same thing. Bought it out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those who were with him in the ark. And again, the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. And, 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 and note, especially verse 16, they, all this went in, and the Lord closed the door behind them. They didn't close the door. God closed the door. So why so many superlatives? Why so many alls? Why so many rep so many repeated? So much repetition. So that, so that we would know that. So that we would know it's important. We had to know it was all of them. There were no exceptions. No exceptions. And there was this much water and it prevailed and it prevailed and it prevailed. And I thought of something. You, they probably got seasick because you know when the, the water. They may have. I, they had no dramamine or anything. You know. no. no. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's quite possible. So you know, if the three accounts come from the three sons of Noah, perhaps one of them said, "We have to make the generations to come realize just how devastating this was." And so the superlative, the third account, the superlative accounts were given. And, and, and then we'll, we'll try to cover both chapters 8 and 9 in the next lesson. But let me just say this in closing. Probably the flood account, along with creation, is the greatest debate between believers of the Bible and unbelievers. Not believers and unbelievers in Christ but believers and unbelievers of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to get into whether someone can be saved and they don't believe the Bible. That, that's between them and God. But if you think about it, creation hinges on the flood account. Everything that, that we study about creation, uh, and, and, and it's not billions of years, it's you know seven literal days and... And, and this is how fossils were, and all of these things, all of that hinges on the flood account. But there's more scientific proof that this happened than anything else exactly. in the Bible. Exactly. That's what I was going to say next. There is more proof for this. I mean, we have to believe in someone rising from the dead in order to be saved. There is much more proof. I mean, I'm not, and I don't, I hesitate to use the word scientific. There's much more factual proof of this than Jesus rising from the dead. But yet, that our salvation depends on that. The, the, the bottom line, the question for us is do you believe it or not? 
I mean, that's that's something every person has to answer for themselves. But but like I said, it's certainly a lot easier than believing someone rose from, from the dead. So the question becomes, how do you pick and choose what you believe? Henry Morris said, the flood is a testament to the awfulness of sin and the reality of the judgment of sin. Yeah, and people don't like that. Uh, People don't like that that sin has been and will be judged. All, all we want to hear, Jesus is love. Well, yes, Jesus is love. And he is so much love that he himself took that judgment. He took that reality of judgment on himself for us. So in chapter 6 and 7, the awfulness of sin has brought on the reality of judgment of that sin. And so then next time we'll see what happens when the flood waters recede. So application, what, what can, uh, in, on that, that sheet that I had for you, the last uh, three questions, what can you praise God for in this chapter? How can this chapter encourage you? If, if the awfulness of sin is judged, how is that an encouragement? Not let your help float your boat. Not let it sink. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, you know, he will do exactly what he said he would do. And all three of these accounts, we have a little bit more detail, a little bit more seriousness. I get, I guess, it would be the word. I want to say a little bit more oomph to it. But in each one of these accounts, you get a little bit more of how detailed and factual. These things were. Yeah. That reference, I think you said in Peter, where it said he referred to it, that was using that God will will provide for the faithful. Yeah. And carry them through the hard times and bring yeah. them to the end. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That you know, that's what we've been seeing over and over in Peter, and that was the reason I wanted to to do that in our Sunday school group was because those people living in the Roman Empire in that day had absolutely no say over anything. You know, how much say do we feel like we have over anything that's happening? Mm -hmm. None. So that puts us right where they are. How did they persevere? How did they make it through? They made it through because they held on to the what was promised to them in heaven. You know, we, we've not... We've not had it bad enough, and I hate to, I don't want to particularly use this as a blanket statement, but in America, we've not had it bad enough yet that our only hope was heaven. But other Christians have. So, but, but that, that's the reason we're studying Peter. Any, anything else on, on Genesis 7? Yes. <coughs> Did, did those animals just start migrating in? I don't know. It just says they came to him, and then they, they came in. Showing up. They just started showing up. That was God. He was putting in. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, back in chapter 2, they all came to Adam when he named them. Yeah. And so here again. And so, as we said, you know, most likely... The, the continents were all connected. It was one land mass. And so it wasn't like they had to travel over oceans and stuff. But it was one land mass, and the different kinds came to him. Yeah. If you, if you, you know, you think about the ones watching him. If you look out and you see that, you know, sometimes it's raining a whole lot, we'll say, where are the animals gathering two by two? You know, of course, we know it's not going to happen again, but that's the yeah. joke about it. So. <laughs> Anything else? I try to imagine how many animals there actually were you know, what, on the ark. Uh, he goes into that in this book, and he goes into it in the other commentary, and I, and I wrote it down somewhere. Off. Seems like the, you know, every, because remember, we're talking about species. Correct. We're not talking about breeds. When it says dog or canine, it's just canine. Yeah. Not 
who all was the all all kinds of great gods. names. Well, yeah. this this study Bible says scholars have estimated that almost forty five thousand animals could have fit into the ark. That's what I was trying to remember. I seem to remember I had a number of sixty thousand, but I, I don't. When he was talking about the space and the cubic size of it, that it would hold that that many. Have y'all been to the ark? Yes. Now they keep they keep telling me in the Tuesday morning group, you gotta go. Oh yeah. No, I haven't either. No, really. It's awesome. Now now you really want to go. Right. Field trip. Field trip. <laughs> I, I told you I said if, if I I'll take me a loaf of bread and jar of peanut butter, I'll be good to go. <laughs> All right. Well let's pray. Father, we, we just love your word. I mean, that, there's so much here. I, I, I really